welcome, 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 welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. In parts one and two, we learned that the major pioneer of jet propulsion technology in the United States, the world's first rocket scientist, Jack Parsons, was a practicing occultist with a firm belief in the legitimacy of the craft of magic. Parsons considered science to be just a different type of magic, both rituals meant for communicating with nature. He embodied both the scientist and the artist in his short but extremely successful rocket development career. Although Parsons didn't study physics, engineering, or chemistry in any formal capacity, he was able to learn quickly on the job, understand the problems to great depth, and come up with novel, technology-changing designs and concepts. It still took his group of scientists and engineers nearly until the end of the 1930s to receive their first major grant for research into the field termed jet propulsion. The military were interested in jet propulsion as a means of getting aircraft quickly airborne where there was insufficient room for a full length runway. They awarded the Rocket Research Group $1,000 to put together a proposal on the feasibility of jet assisted takeoff or JADO. Parsons reported his rockets could reach velocities of 4,875 miles per hour, thereby demonstrating the potential of solid fuels to be more effective than the liquid types, which at the time were the preferred technology. In light of this progress, Caltech and the Galicet Group received an additional $10,000 in research grants from the military. Turns out that a good portion of this funding went to repairing damage to Caltech buildings caused by their experiments. In June 1940, they submitted a report in which they showed the feasibility of their rocket designs for the development of JADO and requested $100,000 to continue. The group received $22,000. Despite the group's growing success, they were ostracized by the other Caltech scientists who grew increasingly irritated by their accidents and noise pollution. Parsons was forced to relocate their experiments back to the Arroyo Seco at a site with unventilated, corrugated iron sheds that served as both research facilities and administrative offices. It was here that JPL would be founded. Parsons and Foreman's rocket experiments became the cover story of the August 1940 edition of Popular Mechanics. In the article, the pair discussed the prospect of rockets being able to ascend above Earth's atmosphere and orbit around it for research purposes. Parsons also mentions the potential for reaching the moon. Jack Parsons once said, everything in nature is beautiful and it is no less beautiful because it's understood. One of Parsons' most interesting innovations with the chemistry of rocket propellants involved something he fetched from history. Parsons was inspired to use asphalt by the ancient incendiary weapon, Greek fire. He experienced an epiphany after watching workers using molten asphalt to fix roofing tiles. Known as number 53, this fuel proved to be significantly more stable than the group's earlier concoctions, fulfilling Parsons' aim of creating a restricted burn rocket fuel inside a castable container and providing a thrust 427% more powerful than that of number 27. This set a precedent, which according to his biographer John Carter, changed the future of rocket technology. The thermoplastic asphalt casting was durable in all climates, allowed for mass production, safe handling and storage. This transformed solid fuel agents into safe and viable forms of rocket propulsion. Plasticized variants of Parsons' solid fuel design, invented by JPL's Charles Bartley, were later used by NASA in the Space Shuttle's solid rocket boosters, and in the Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now that things were moving in the lab and money was rolling in, Parsons had some time and disposable income to really get involved with Aleister Crowley's cult, the Order Templi Orientis, or the OTO Church. He traveled around the United States, meeting both rocketry and magic practitioners. 
he became something of a celebrity in certain circles. Parsons had, shall we say, permissive views on sexuality and relationships. In 1941, his wife Helen took a trip and, with the firm encouragement of his fellow OTO church members, he used the opportunity to get a little closer to her 17-year-old sister, Sarah Northrup. Upon Helen's return, Sarah asserted that she was Parsons' new wife, and Parsons himself admitted that he found Sarah more sexually attractive than Helen. Conflicted in her feelings, Helen sought comfort in church member Wilfred Talbot Smith and began a relationship with him that lasted for the rest of his life, and the four, strangely, remained friends. The two couples, along with a number of other church members, some with their children, moved into a big house on South Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena. They all contributed to the rent and lived communally. The group referred to the property as the Parsonage. The happy family also sacrificed livestock on the property as part of blood rituals. Parsons converted the garage and laundry room into a full chemical laboratory. Although there were arguments among the commune members, Parsons remained dedicated to Thelema. He gave almost all of his salary to the OTO while actively seeking out new members. Parsons' enthusiasm for the church lodge quickly began to impact his professional life. He frequently appeared at Aerojet hungover and sleep deprived from the late nights of lodge activities. He invited many of his colleagues to them. The church lodge soon came under investigation by both the Pasadena Police Department and the FBI. Both had received allegations about a black magic cult involved in sexual orgies. One complaint was from a 16-year-old boy who said that he was raped by the lodge members. Neighbors reported a ritual involving a naked pregnant woman jumping through fire. Parsons explained that the lodge was simply an organization dedicated to religious and philosophical speculation. Neither the police nor FBI found evidence of illegal activity and came to the conclusion that the lodge constituted no threat to national security. Even though Parsons had beaten the case, his life was spiraling. He'd always been a long-term heavy user of alcohol and marijuana, but Parsons now habitually used cocaine, amphetamines, and opiates. He continued to have sexual relations with multiple women, including the fiance of his close colleague. When Parsons paid for her to have an abortion, his colleague was furious and their friendship ended. In 1944, Jack Parsons was pushed out of his position at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory due to his occult connections and the turmoil in his personal life. Now disassociated from JPL and Aerojet, Parsons and Foreman founded a new company, the Ad Astra Engineering Company. Within a few months, Ad Astra was also subject to an FBI investigation under the suspicion of espionage. Parsonage resident Alva Rogers recalled in a 1962 article for an occultist magazine. In the ads placed in the local paper, Jack specified only that bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, or any other exotic type need to apply for rooms. Any mundane soul would be unceremoniously rejected. Science fiction writer and U.S. Navy officer L. Ron Hubbard soon moved into the parsonage. He and Parsons became close friends. Parsons wrote to Crowley that although Hubbard had no formal training in magic, he has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. From some of his experiences, I deduce that he is in direct touch with some higher intelligence, possibly his guardian angel. He is the most thelemic person I have ever met, and he is in complete accord with our own principles. Parsons and Sarah were in an open relationship, encouraged by the OTO, and she became enamored with L. Ron Hubbard. Parsons did not love this. Despite attempting to repress his passions, he became intensely jealous. Parsons began to devote his energies to conducting black magic, causing concern among fellow OTO members. Some of them believed that it was invoking troublesome spirits into the parsonage. Another resident of the house wrote to Alistair Crowley, 
Saying that, our own Jack is enamored with witchcraft and voodoo. From the start, he always wanted to invoke something, no matter what. I'm inclined to think, as long as he got a result. He told the residents that he was imbuing statues in the house with a magical energy in order to sell them to fellow occultists. Parsons reported paranormal events in the house resulting from these rituals, including poltergeist activity, sightings of orbs and ghostly apparitions, and disembodied voices. The Sunday Times published an article about Hubbard's involvement with the OTO and Parsons' occult activities. In response, the Church of Scientology released a press statement which said that Hubbard had been sent as an undercover agent by the U.S. Navy to intercept and destroy Parsons' black magic cult and save Sarah Northrup from its influence. What a hero, that L. Ron Hubbard. Parsons had to sell the Parsonage house, which was then demolished, and he resigned from the OTO. He wrote in his letter to Crowley that he did not believe that as an autocratic organization, the OTO constitutes a true and proper medium for the expression and attainment of Thelema. Jack Parsons once said, the liberty of the individual is the foundation of civilization. No true civilization is possible without this liberty, and no state, national or international, is stable in its absence. At the emergence of the Cold War, a red scare developed in the U.S. as the Congressional House of Un-American Activities Committee began investigating and obstructing the careers of people with perceived communist sympathies. Many of Parsons' former colleagues lost their security clearances and jobs as a result. Eventually, the FBI stripped Parsons of his clearance because of his subversive character, including his involvement in and advocacy of sexual perversion in the OTO. Biographer George Pendell said, Parsons treated magic and rocketry as different sides of the same coin. Both had been disparaged, both derided as impossible, but because of this, both presented themselves as challenges to be conquered. Rocketry postulated that we should no longer see ourselves as creatures chained to the earth, but as beings capable of exploring the universe. Similarly, magic suggested there were unseen metaphysical worlds that existed and could be explored with the right knowledge. Both rocketry and magic were rebellions against the very limits of human existence. In striving for one challenge, he could not help but strive for the other. By the end, Parsons was totally unable to pursue his scientific career. He was without his wife and devoid of any friends and colleagues. With this, he sank even deeper into occultism and embarked on a sexually based magical operation with hookers. Following the ritualistic practice of the OTO, Parsons performed the ritual of the crossing of the abyss, attaining union with the universal consciousness. Following his apparent success in doing so, Parsons recounted having out-of-body experiences, which he referred to as a black pilgrimage. To make a living, he founded the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company, which was based in North Hollywood. The company created pyrotechnics and explosives, such as fog effects and imitation gunshots for the film industry. Parsons also founded a new thelemite group known as the Witchcraft. He offered a course in its teachings for a $10 fee, which included a new thelemic belief system called the Gnosis, a version of Christian Gnosticism with Sophia as its godhead and the Christian god as its demiurge. On June 17, 1952, Parsons received a rush order for explosives for a film set and began to work on the manufacturing in his, in his home laboratory. An explosion destroyed the lower part of the building, during which Parsons sustained mortal wounds. His right forearm was amputated, his legs and left arm were broken and a hole was torn in the right side of his face. Despite these critical injuries, Parsons was found conscious by the upstairs lodgers. He tried to communicate with the arriving ambulance workers who rushed him to the Huntington Memorial Hospital where he was declared dead approximately 37 minutes after the explosion. When his mother Ruth learned of his death, 
she immediately took a fatal overdose of barbiturates. Pasadena Police Department criminologist Don Harding led the official investigation. He concluded that Parsons had been mixing mercury fulminate in a coffee can when he dropped it on the floor. This caused the initial explosion, which worsened when it came into contact with the other chemicals in the room. Some of Parson's colleagues rejected this explanation, saying that he was very attentive about safety. Two colleagues from Burmite Powder Company described Parson's work habits as scrupulously neat and exceptionally cautious. The latter statement from chemical engineer George Centimers insisted that the explosion must have come from beneath the floorboards, implying an organized plot to kill Jack Parsons. Parsons' obituary in the June 19, 1952 edition of the Pasadena Independent read, John W. Parsons, a handsome 37-year-old rocket scientist, killed Tuesday in a chemical explosion, was one of the founders of a weird, semi-religious cult that flourished here about 10 years ago. Old police reports yesterday pictured the former Caltech professor as a man who led a double existence, a down-to-earth explosives expert who dabbled in intellectual necromancy. Possibly, he was trying to reconcile the fundamental human urges with the inhuman, Buck Rogers type of innovations that sprang from his test tubes. Rocket science can certainly be complex, but not as complex as personalities and people. Jack Parsons displayed qualities worthy of the Vanadium Wall of Heroes, but there was a lot of darkness in that man's soul. During the course of this research, I changed my mind several times about what I thought of Jack Parsons. Was he a hero or a kind of monster? He was both, I suppose. One thing is for sure, his life was rich, important, and worth knowing. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.